Amen. Well, Happy New Year. Now we all got to write 2019 instead of 2018 again. Get into practice. All right, if you'll turn your Bibles to Judges 19. Uh, if you need a sheet, if you'd raise your hand, we'll get you a sheet. If you need a Bible, raise both hands. Let's keep up with your sheets. We only have... Uh, tonight and two more weeks of the book of Judges and then I'm going to run into, we'll probably go to Ruth and then I think we might spend a little time in the New Testament. It's funny because when you read it and you stay in the Old Testament for a while and you really get that down in your spirit and then you go to the New Testament and you go, oh my gosh, they are so connected. And you, you, things that you didn't, when you've read it in the past, the New Testament, you, you now have kind of like the background to it and so now when you read it in the New Testament you go oh I know exactly what they're talking about we read that I studied that I didn't just read through it I studied it we studied it so um, let's do a quick review real quick on where we are um, if you remember that God had commanded Israel to destroy all the Canaanites and all their gods and all their temples uh, when they entered the land under Joshua but Israel did not obey and as a result, the children of Israel began to do what was right in their own eyes. We see that statement in every single chapter. They began to do what's right in their own eyes. And, and when you get to that point, you're in trouble because you're not doing the will of God. You're not doing what God says. You're doing what you think is right. And you're operating in the flesh, which is exactly why we're all fasting. We want to get out of operating in our flesh. We want to operate totally in our spirit. I mean, you have to walk, eat, sleep, those things. But if you can stay in the spirit, if your spirit's strong enough, then any obstacle, anything that God has called you to do, you can just slide in it because now you are talking directly to him. Your spirit is responding, and it's a lot, a lot more simple and a lot more productive. All right, so they were supposed to wipe them out. Uh, eventually, they took on the Canaanites' customs. They married the women, and they took on their gods. And even though it was uh, strictly forbidden. Uh, the, the, at the very end, Judges kind of set up weird. You have two introduction stories, and then you had all the Judges, and then at the very end, you have two conclusion stories, two different ones. The last one was the story of Micah and his Levite, and it tells how the uh, decisions of two men began idolatry in the nation of Israel. They had already been um, independently dabbling into it, but now because of these two men, because of this Levite, which is Jonathan, coming in to the nation and kind of taking a leadership role, the whole nation as a whole is now is in deep into idolatry, uh, which does not turn out well for them. This final piece of history covered in the book of, of Jude, Judges. Did anybody read ahead? Hold on, man, because it is it's tragic and it is disturbing. It really is. But it just shows how sinful Israel has become. And it all begins with a sinful relationship between a Levite and his concubine, or his mistress is what we would call it these days. All right, let's pick up in Judges 19, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel... We've all heard this statement again, too. This is just showing you when this time period is. This time period is right after Joshua has died, and, 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 and they have no one to serve, so to speak. They should be serving Jesus, God as, as king, but they're not. They're not at all. And, the, and it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. He took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. That's the same city that the last Levite was in. Now, the Life Application Study Bible, anybody ever had that? It's, it's a really good study, uh, study Bible. It kind of gives you a little uh, history and day-to-day -day information that just is really helpful. So I looked up concubines, and this is what it said a concubine is. Having concubines was an acceptable part of the Israelite society, although this is not what God intended. You can look in Genesis 2. A concubine had most of the duties, but only some of the privileges of a wife. Although she was legally attached to one man, she and her children usually did not have the inheritance right of the legal wife and legitimate children. Her primary purpose was to provide sex, bearing additional children, and contributing more help to the household or estate. In other words, this tells us, and especially if you go back and read Genesis 2, that sex outside of marriage is a sin even if it's acceptable in a society. Are we not there now? I can remember when I was growing up, if you lived with someone, it, you know, people would raise their eyes. 
I mean, your grandmama would be all in your face. But now, it's not. Go to that first slide. I think you're going to be able to read it because I want to read this. Can you read it? Maybe. This is 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20. Gosh, this is a great scripture. I'm telling you. There are scriptures in the Bible that are, that are, they're all great, but there are some that is like the deep fundamentals of life, and this is one of them. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? May it never be. Or do you not know, this is good, or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a harlot is one body with her? For he says the two will become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body." See, so many people like to to, to categorize sins, and I might put this one here, but what it's basically saying is all other sins are outside of the body. But when you have sex with somebody that you're not married to, that's the sin within your body, and that's where the Holy Ghost is. Marriage, there's a reason that you consummate your marriage on the first day that you get married. It's because at that point, you two become one, not just physically, but spiritually. There is a connection. That's why so many people have a hard time that, that sleep around, that have a hard time committing and connecting to their husband or to their wife. It's because they have connected with so many others. Once again, I don't want to get anybody, everybody turn white, you know, that, but there is forgiveness and you can have it restored. But there is an order that God wants you to have. And, and sexual immorality is different from the rest of them. Again, I just stress it so much to the youth. Abstain until you're married. Because when you get married and on that night, it is a spiritual thing that you can come together with and you become one. Just like it is with Jesus. Just like it is when you get saved. (laughs) Y'all, every one of them is like... (laughs) It's going to get so much more uncomfortable. Um, Just wait. You belong to God. The Holy Spirit lives in your body. Sex outside the marriage is a sin against yourself, your partner, and your God. It's that simple. Uh, There's another aspect I want to get to before we turn in, because I want you to see the gravity of this story. Uh, Turn with me to Numbers 3-5, because I want you to get a good, strong understanding of what a Levite was and what he stood for. Numbers 3-5. You there? Almost? All right, verse 5. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near and present him before Aaron the priest, that they may serve him. And they shall attend to his needs and the needs of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of meetings to do the work of the tabernacle. Verse 8. Also they shall attend to all the furnishings of the tabernacle of meeting and to the needs of the children of Israel to do the work of the tabernacle. And you shall give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are given entirely to him from among the children of Israel. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to their priesthood. But the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Verse 11. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel, instead of every firstborn who opens a womb among the children of Israel. Therefore the Levites shall be mine. Because, of all, because all the firstborn are mine. On that day I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. I sanctified to myself all the firstborn in Egypt, both man and beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. So because God sanctified the firstborn, uh, in the 12 plagues, the very last plague was that the firstborn of every family would die. And uh, unless they took a lamb, killed the lamb, and put, this is so symbolic, take the lamb and put the blood of the lamb on their post. 
And when that death angel that came in to kill all the firstborn would come by, if you had the blood of the lamb, then it would pass over your threshold and it wouldn't touch you. And so God said, because I have bought that firstborn, I bought that firstborn with that. You should have died, but now you are mine. Every firstborn in the family. He said, but I don't want that. What I want is I'm going to make you a trade. Instead of taking all the firstborn, I want all the Levites. They are now mine. They will serve the temple. You had to be a son of Aaron or a, or a descendant of Aaron in order to be a priest that actually did the priestly duties. But there were other duties like taking care of the tabernacle. At one time it was mobile, so they would have to pick it up and, and you know put it together and all that. And so uh, the Levites' job on the number one thing was to serve the people. They were to teach the people. They were to be the moral standard of the people. And so how the Levites went, how the people went. So we can see now we have a concubine and we have an, a Levite and them coming together is going to c- just create a horrible, horrible mess that to this day we are still talking about it. So let's read. Oh, I did want to read this. They were to serve the people of the Lord in the temple, but they ended up serving themselves and the Canaanite, Canaanite uh, gods. Verse 2. But the concubine played the harlot against him. Well, let me stop real quick because a lot of translations, I, I don't understand this at all, but a lot of translations say uh, she ran away from him, she got angry with him or whatever. It's different translations. But I looked exhaustively and all, when I, every time I saw this word, I think it's Zana, every time it's used in the Bible, it's used as somebody being, I'm just going to say the word, somebody being a whore, somebody jumping around to everybody. And so I'm just going to have to take that at, 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 at face value and say that's what she did. She left his house and she's going back home. So let's pick up in two again. But his concubine played the harlot against him and went away from him to his father's house at Bethlehem in Judah and was there four whole months. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and to bring her back, having the servant and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him to her father's house, and when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. <sighs> Such a weird situation. So she goes off. She uh, messes around with him without, you know, outside of the marriage. He decides after four months he wants her back. I'll let your imagination go, and you'll understand totally what I'm talking about later on. He wanted her back because he was, she was his concubine. So she goes to the house, her dad's house, where she's at, or he does, and the dad is happy to see him. Now, there's a lot of different scenarios I played in my mind, like why would he be so happy to see him? Uh, maybe because he knew that he was a Levite, he was prominent, he would take real good care of her. Maybe he didn't want him in the house anymore. I mean, she did not have the greatest morals. You know, maybe she was really, I, I, I don't know. But anyway, he was there and he was happy that the guy, the Levite, was coming to get him, coming to get her and probably take her back with him. Y'all, again, it is hilarious sometimes to do research and read what people will write books on. It's, I go, wow, you have just so wasted half of your life on whether... Anyway, verse 4. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him, and he stayed with him three days. So they ate, and they drank, and they lodged there. Then it came to pass on the fourth day that they rose early in the morning and he stood to depart. But the young woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh your heart with a morsel of bread and go afterward on your way. So they sat down and the two of them ate and drank together. Then the young woman's father said to the man, Please be content to stay all night and let your heart be merry. In other words, let's do some hardcore drinking. Verse 7, And when the man stood to depart, his father-in-law urged him. So he lodged there again. Then he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart, but the young man's father said, Please refresh your heart. So they delayed until afternoon, and both of them ate. Verse 9, And when the man stood to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the young woman's father, said to him, Look, the day is now drawing towards evening. Please spend the night. See, the day is coming to an end. Lodge here that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow you go your way early so that you may get home. Verse 10, however, the man was not willing to spend the night. So he rose and departed and came upon Jebus, Jebus, which is now Jerusalem. With him him were the two saddled donkeys, his concubine, and also with him. So undoubtedly, the father really wanted him to stay. I don't know if he wanted to make a good impression on him, so maybe he would, you know, the Levite would keep the daughter. or, Or really, it could have been even that he was just customarily, you're supposed to take care of your guest 
especially if it's a, if it's a Levite. So now they end up in a place opposite Jerusalem. Uh, it's called Yabus. It's actually the smaller part of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem is now, it does not, it, the Jesuitites live there. No, no Israelites really live there, just a dabble of them. So it's not the Jerusalem that you're thinking where the temple is and all that. This is just a city that eventually will be. Verse 11, they were near Jebus, and the day was far spent. And the servant said to his master, Come, please, and let us turn aside into the city of Jebusites and lodge in it. But his master said to him, We will not turn aside here into a city of foreigners who are not of the children of Israel. We will go on to Gabeah. So he said to his servant, Come, let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night in Gabeah or in Ramal. And they passed by, and they went their way, and the sun went down on them near Jebeah, which belongs to Benjamin. Now, Jebeah was a Levitical city, and this Levite probably felt more comfortable to go into a city that was a Levitical city where there were Israelites there. In fact, they owned that, or they owned, they, they uh, possessed that land. They lived in that land, so he felt very safe in going there. He didn't want to go somewhere else. Remember, this is in a late afternoon. It's almost dark, if not dark. And he's getting, they're getting a little antsy because they need a place to stay, and it's just not a good idea to stay in a city out in the open. So he goes on to the city that is uh, belongs to the tribe of Benjamin. Remember that. Verse 15, They turned aside there to go into the lodge in Gib- Gib- uh, Gibeah, And when he went in, he sat down in the open square of the city, for no one would take them in his house to spend the night. So the Levite and the concubine found no hospitality in Gabeah, which I really should have put up a red flag for him to get out because uh, the Middle East, even now, are very, very strong in their traditions. And they believe that if somebody comes to your house or if there's somebody in town that has nowhere to stay, then they are uh, more than obliged. They are compelled to bring people in and keep them and to keep them safe. It's just built into them. Let me read Leviticus 19.33. It was also a law. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt, and I am the Lord your God. So they were compelled and by law to take care of strangers. You'll see that a lot in the Old Testament where people are just traveling through and people will just bring them in and feed them and, and, and take care of them. And, and, and it was, it's just built into it. A little bit like that in the South, but not quite. I'm not going to get a stranger out of the street. <laughs> Verse 16. Just then an old man came in from his work in the field that evening who was also from the mountains of Ephraim. He was from the same area that this Levite was. He was staying in Gabeah where the men of the place were Benjamites. you got to remember that this city is a Benjamite city. It is one of the 12 cities of the 12 tribes of of, uh, Israel's cities. He should have felt very, very comfortable there. So this guy that here, this old man, is not a native. He's just living there. Verse 17, and when he raised his eyes, he saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, where are you going and where do you come from? 18, so he said to them, we are passing from Bethlehem in Judah toward the remote mountains of Ephraim. I am from there. I went to Bethlehem in Judah. Now I'm going to the house of the Lord. He's going to Shiloh, not Jerusalem, obviously. But there's no one who will take me in his house. Although we both have straw and fodder for our donkeys and bread and wine for myself, for your female servant, and for the young man who is with your servant, there is no lacking. In other words, he's saying, look, all you got to do is just, we just need somewhere to stay. You don't have to feed us. You don't have to do anything. We brought everything with us. Verse 20, and the old man said, peace be with you. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. So he, bought him, he brought him into his house and gave him fodder for the donkeys, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. Once again, it goes back to the, the, the law that says that if there's a visitor coming in, you are, you are compelled or you're by law to bring them in. It would be a dishonor if you didn't bring them in. It would be a dishonor if they said no. Verse 22. As they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came to your house, that we may know him carnally. 
Now, if you if you spend any time reading in, in uh, Genesis, especially Genesis 19, you can see that sounds exactly like what happened to Lot. He went and he went into this city. There was somebody that took him in, and uh, a group of homosexuals came in, and they wanted. They said, "Send us the men. We don't want the women. We want the men." <coughs> it's interesting because I think the writer connected that with the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is that's where Lot was, to show you just how evil it was in this city, just how evil it had become. He's putting a connection because anytime you say Sodom and Gomorrah, you, that's the first thing you think of. You think of how horrible, how, how degenerate it had become. Well, Israel was there. 23, but the man, the master of the house, went out to them. This is going to blow you away. And said to them, no, my brother, and I beg you, do not act so wickedly. Seeing this man has come to my house, do not commit this outrage. Look, here's my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let me bring them out. Now humble them and do with them as you please. But to this man, do not do such a vile thing. But the man would not heed him. So the man took his concubine and brought her out to them, and they knew her and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. I'm guessing that the old man thought it was just the best of two evils. If you're, you know, it was horrible to send a man out. It's horrible to send his daughter and the girl out, but it would have been worse in his eyes to send the man out. Uh, 25, but the man would not heed, so the man took his concubine and brought, her, and brought her out to them, and they knew her and abused her all night until morning, and when the day began to break, they let her go. Then the woman came as the day was drawing and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. You know, it's funny because the fall of many great civilizations is the open practice of homosexuality. If you're a history bus at all, you'll see it's the pushing force that just plummets, plummets the generation to something horrible if it's not already there. Again, it's the same response to um, Sodom and Gomorrah. I did want to read this real quick. I thought this was interesting. In his thinking, offering the woman to the crowd was lesser of the two evils and fulfilled his cultural obligation to protect the Levite. The underlining thing is today rape is seen as is, is a is a sin, and, it, and it's, it, you can go to jail for it, but when I read the scripture, God sees it as the same thing as murder. Deuteronomy 22, 25. I think, it's, I, think I have that slide. Yeah. The, man, the man forces her and lies with her. Then only the man who lies with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the girl. There's no sin in the girl worthy of death. For just as a man rises against his neighbor and murders him, so is this case. So God sees this along the same line. I'm not even going to go into it, but you hear so many people say that Christianity is not a Christianity for women. And you know what? If you read the scriptures, you're dead wrong because God protects women. He uses women. It, all throughout the Bible it's there. He, but he gives specific laws. It is men, it is man, not men, mankind that just messes it up. They make their own laws, but that is not how God is. So God says the woman is not, not guilty. It's the man and he should die. 27. I ain't going there. 27. When her master arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way, there was this concubine falling at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. And he said to her, Get up and let's be going. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her onto the donkey, and the man got up and went to his place. When he entered the house, he took a knife, laid hold of his concubine, and divided her into 12 pieces. Lamp, this is a great guy limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And so it was that all who saw it said, No such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, confer, and speak up. So he gets up the next morning to leave. And he opens the door and he finds his concubine there. She's laying on the, on the floor. I, it doesn't appear she has died yet, but she will on the way going home. Um, 
He didn't even talk to her in compassion. You know, I think this story really is trying to show us the, the, the generation of the heart of Israel at that point. That it had gotten so bad that they had done exactly what God said would happen. God said, if you do not go in and totally wipe out the Canaanites, totally get rid of their gods, kill their animals, wipe them off of the face of the earth, it will come back and it will be a thorn in your side and it will just be trouble, trouble, trouble. And it's exactly what happened. Here it is now at this point, at this low point, that they are doing exactly what the Canaanites were doing. If you've done any study, the Canaanites in the Bible are kind of grouped into this big group. They're all, there's a bunch of different names, Amorites, you know, all those. And if you go back and look at history, they were a brutal, brutal, kind of like the Romans, brutal people. And so he says, look, if you follow them, then you'll all die. Wipe them out now so that you can survive and you can be a shining light. But they just wouldn't do it. They, it's just like people with their sin. People think they can deal with it. God says, look, when you get saved, wh I'm washing all your sin as if you never did it. That's a good God. That's what he wanted them to do. That's what the shadow is, is that the Canaanites were sin and they had to be wiped out. Because if it doesn't and you hold on to those sins, those sins will come back. They will if you hold on to them. But if you do it, look, one of the greatest things that the devil, not greatest, that's a bad word, one of the most productive things that the devil does is remind you of your past. If you do something and you truly ask God to forgive you of all your sins, he forgives you. The hard part is you forgiving yourself. You have to do it. The devil will throw it back. You're not who you are. think you are. You've done this. You've done this. You've done this. But you know what? You're not. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God, and you are washed clean. Throw it out of your head. Rebuke it. Throw it out. Because now you are. That's what it talks about. You are a new creature. You are, look, we, we were talking the other day, uh, Pastor Mike and I and Lacey and Sam, and talking about when Pastor Mike and I dated for like ever. I, we started dating when we were 17 and 18, and we were different people there then. And we were talking about some things that were going on in our life then, and both of us were like, oh, my gosh. It's, I, can't even I can't even see myself in those situations anymore. And you know why? Because I'm a new person. I'm a different person. I don't think the same. I don't act the same. I definitely don't look the same. <laughs> but I am a new creation. And, gosh, if you can get that down in your spirit, wow, you can do great things. All right, so the woman, after being released, died from the injuries. Uh, he went back and hooked, uh, <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. Now, he went back and he cut her up in 12 pieces. He cut her up. What he was doing is he was sending to each of the territories, each of the tribes of Israel. He sent them to him and going, look what our brothers, the Benjamites, did to my concubine. Look what they did. And what he's trying to do, the last thing he said was consider it, confer or talk about it, and speak it up. His goal is to get them all to get up and do something about Benjamin. And you know what? They do. In the next few chapters, it is a civil war. The, tw the other tribes of Israel actually come in and they attack, attack one of their own brothers, Benjamin. One of their own families. So the one act, that's the bizarre thing, the act of this Levite and this concubine would create a civil war where thousands and thousands of people died. And it's still talked about today. In fact, I was looking in Hosea 9.9, 9, it says, these are deeply corrupted, as in the days of Gabeah. So now when you run across that, you'll see it several times. You run across that, and you go, that was pretty bad. That was like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, there was no chopping up and sending out in that. But uh, Hosea 10.9 says, O Israel, you have sinned from the days of Gabeah. So, once again, you see how, how degenerate, how disturbing they had become. And in the next few chapters, you're going to see how even further it goes. It, it's, it, it doesn't get any more graphic or, or anything, but there's a lot of bloodshed from this one union that should have never been. Amen? All right. I, I really encourage you, too, to um, read ahead because... Some of these stories, once you've read the, all three chapters and then you come back and you get more out of it as you're reading and we're studying through it. So 
All right, let's read. Number one, true or false? God allowed a few tribes to simply live among the Canaanites. False. Number two, complete 1 Corinthians 6.16. 6, or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. I just did it for you. You're welcome. Number three, Gabeah belonged to which tribe? Benjamin. You need to remember that because then it's going to come into play if you read any more. Oh my gosh, if it's going to come into play if you read the rest of the Bible. Um, is this civil war between all the tribes and Benjamin? And number four, according to Leviticus 19.33, the children of Israel were to treat a stranger as if they were natives among them. Number five, what did the sinful man of Benjamin request of the master of the house? Yeah, bring out your male 